All right, I know that <clears throat> it's been a couple weeks since we uh, left off in our series that we've been doing on the life of Jesus, looking at it chronologically. Uh, we had Easter, and then um, Joe spoke uh, last week on the temple of the Lord. Uh, we're going to jump back into uh, the, the life of Jesus. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12 uh, this morning. But just as a little bit of a recap, because um, you may, I mean, you've forgotten where we were. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, it was the story of Martha and Mary. And we were looking at the differences between their response and their priorities when it came to having Jesus in their presence. Uh, obviously, uh, we, most of you probably know that story pretty well. Uh, we know that one was distracted, one was uh, more focused on being in the presence of Jesus. Uh, but since then, the scene has changed. Uh, we know that although we just celebrated Easter and talked about the cross and resurrection, we're still marching towards the final days of Jesus. And we're probably just a couple months away if we look at the timeline of, of Luke. Uh, but before we get to that, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, pray with me that God would speak to us, uh, that we would learn something uh, today that we can put into to practice throughout this week. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is a light to our feet. It's a light for us in, in how we navigate this life. And I thank you that uh, we can look to these, these passages and, and, God, you have something to say to us today and how we can apply that to our, our lives throughout the week and even today. Uh, I pray this morning that you would speak through me, uh, get me out of the way, and that your message would um, talk to the hearts of your people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said, the scene has changed. Instead of a more intimate setting with few people, we're now at a point where um, Jesus is preaching. And actually, uh, the passage that I'm, I'm pulling from this morning is really Jesus' sermon. So it's a little bit of plagiarism on my part uh, to take out of Luke and basically preach Jesus' sermon. Uh, but what has happened is Jesus has come to this point and he is now preaching, and as he's preaching, more and more people begin to gather. Uh, this would be like if, I, I don't know who to compare him to anymore, but if Billy Graham was still alive, if uh, Billy Graham was still traveling, it would be like a figure like that coming to our church. It would pull crowds in that we don't normally have. So even more than Billy Graham, we're talking about Jesus who is preaching, and, and now there's so many people, and obviously he doesn't have a sound system to work with, uh, they're basically climbing over each other to hear what Jesus has to say. And that is the scene that we have right now. And that's important because there comes a point where Peter uh, has a question about uh, the context of what Jesus is saying. So let's go ahead and read uh, Luke chapter 12. And uh, we were in Luke chapter 10 when Sam last preached. And if you'd like, please do. You can read through um, 10... So Martha and Mary is chapter 10, verse 38 is where it starts. Now we're going to jump forward to Luke chapter 12, but please read the in-between of those things. There's lots of good things um, to look at, and there's lots of things you're probably a little bit familiar with already. For example, in 11, there's the Lord's Prayer, uh, and then also we see um, the sign of Jonah, the light in you, the woe to Pharisees and lawyers. And, and then in the beginning of chapter 12, he talks about having no fear, um, acknowledging Christ before men, and the parable of the rich fool, and also has a little bit something to say about anxiousness. So there's lots of good stuff to look at between where Sam left off and where I'm picking up. And I want to give you a little bit of background of how I've come up with this passage in particular. So when we look at our sermons, um, actually the sermon calendar, a lot of the topics that were in between 10 and 12 we've covered already at some point during this, this sermon series. But there's th something in particular that stood out to me in verse 35, and I'll go ahead and start reading. Uh, it says, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And I read that verse at 35, and I had to stop, and like that's, that's what I need to focus on personally, and that's what I feel like is something God wants to share with His people. So let's go on to uh, verse 40. We're starting at 36, I just left off. It says, Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. 
Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them reclined at the table and he will come and serve them. This is actually Jesus talking about um, when he will become the servant. Uh, If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake. Now, when they would tell time at this point, the second and third watch, we're talking about Jesus saying, if the master comes in the middle of the night, if if the master comes... Um, towards the end of the night into the early morning. Um, Blessed are those servants that he would find awake. So these servants that he's talking about are ready and waiting even into the the late hours of the night, early morning. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Before we get into uh, verse 35, this is um, a little bit off topic, but uh, one of the videos that Sam and I recorded recently had to do with the rapture, when the church will be raptured up. Um, there's arguments for before the tribulation, maybe in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, or after the tribulation. I think that this verse sums up everything uh, about what we discussed. And and we can discuss those things. We can disagree about them. That's fine. The most important thing is no matter when Jesus comes back, we are ready. And that's what the point of this uh, passage is. So let's look at verse 35. Now, I grew up in a King James only church. Any other version? And you were reading a perverted uh, translation. Now, I'm preaching out of the ESV this morning. But I like the KJV still, and the way this is worded in here, and uh, Luke, I don't have the remote, so you might have to skip forward, Uh, but the first slide here is being ready for service, and that's what the first part of verse 35 says. If you're reading the King James, it would say this, let your loins be girded, or gird your loins, and you would be, and Preston's looking at me like, what in the world is girding your loins have to do with anything? And I understand that, we don't talk like that. Um, if any of you like grilling or smoking things, when I think of loins, I think of like pork tenderloin, uh, maybe um, tenderloin, beef tenderloin. Those are delicious. Has nothing to do with King James uh, translation. Loins be girded. So uh, I never thought I would say those words in a sermon, uh, but here we are. And I don't know if you can see this picture, but this is an example of what it meant. So the dress at that time, they didn't have uh, athletic shorts. They didn't have uh, the attire that we have today. So if, if we know we're going to battle, obviously our servicemen and women have the correct attire for that purpose, and they can go into battle. If we know we're going to do um, some heavy labor, um, you know, maybe uh, you'd be guarding me or something, you have the attire to do it. Basically, they had tunics, and then they would customize how they wore them based on what was uh, at hand. Now, the, the word gird up your loins, it basically would mean that you were, you're doing heavy, heavy labor, going into battle, or you needed to run for some reason. Uh, I don't like running, but basically what they would do is they would lift up their tunics, tie them around their waist, and convert them into a pair of shorts. Now you guys can leave with that much information. It's important, though, because if we talk about our spirituality and what they're doing, that's why it's important to know what Jesus is talking about. Um, And then the other thing is Proverbs 31. We know that that chapter is specifically directed um, or applicable to women. And I don't know if you know this, but in Proverbs 31, let me find this real quick. I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, Proverbs 31, 17. And this, this will sound very familiar to what I just read. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. So if you were wondering if this message was just going to be uh, another men's Bible study, it does apply to women as well. Um, Because this has to do with our spiritual battle. um, And then just like Proverbs 31, that can be translated as well uh, about girding up your loins. All right. So be ready and serving while we wait. And we can move on to this next part of that. Actually, let me give you a little bit of illustration to to kind of bring this home about being ready, being ready for service. I believe that God has given each and every one of you 
a purpose, and, and you were born to the parents you had. You were living in the city you were. You went to the school you went to. Um, you married your spouse. You were in the career. Everything was very specific. I think God is a God of details. And you guys will reach people that I won't reach. You'll be in contact with people I'll never meet. So it's very important that we all understand that we're, we're vital to the mission of God. Um, we all have something to do. That, that's kind of the point, is that we are all uniquely made and uniquely positioned to do something that God has um, for us, that he's already prepared for us, for us to do. Now, I also think that there's sometimes we're not just careers, but if we start getting into like some smaller details, he can use our hobbies as well. But I want to talk to you a little illustration of my failures of being ready for when the master would come home. Uh, my mom, during the summer would leave my sister and I a chore list. Do you guys have any chore lists? Any chore lists when you stay home? Nobody? All right. When I would stay home, my mom would leave a list and said, you have to have this finished before I get home. Sometimes it was doing the dishes. Sometimes it was folding laundry, dusting, uh, vacuuming. And I don't know, Preston, I don't know about you and Logan, you guys probably don't procrastinate. You do everything right as you're supposed to as soon as you wake up, right? I was bad at that. Here's what would happen. My mom would get home about 3.30, about 3 o'clock rolled around, and guess who was just starting to look at the list to see what needed to be done? Yeah, that was me. That was me flying, trying to fly through the chores that needed to be done. I was not ready for my master to get home. And there's a part of me that as I was thinking about that illustration and preparing for this message, uh, I've been guilty of that several times with what I knew God wanted me to do. He had a conviction on my heart that I needed to move forward with something, and I kept putting it off, maybe because it was of security and whatever I was doing before, maybe it was comfort, but there was something for me to do, and I was not ready because I kept putting things off. All right, let's move on to keep your lamps burning. This uh, passage here, so lamps burning, is talking about oil lamps, um, you guys know the song, This Little Light of Mine, and what that meant. Uh, we all learned that in uh, Sunday school, probably. What we're talking about is the light of salvation. Uh, we are to be a light in this world as well. This world is actually dark. It's full of sin. Uh, evil has full reign, it seems like. And we are to be the light. And we are to keep our lamps burning. Uh, if you have your uh, Bibles or app, you can go to Matthew 25. This is interesting uh, because it's the parable of the ten virgins. And I'm going to go ahead and read this to you because this is a tough passage to, passage to read, especially if you're someone who may be guilty of uh, just coming to church or maybe professing Christianity, but you struggle or maybe even never had a close relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to read out of Matthew 25. It's just a few verses, actually 13. I'll go quick, though. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, uh, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, uh, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will be not enough for us and you, go to the dealers and buy yourself, buy for yourselves. And while they were going out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, that passage in particular, and even what we're looking at here about keeping your lamps burning, this is for the Christian. Now, Matthew 25, these girls served a function. So the purpose of these, these virgins having a lamp in, for the, in the first place is that they could light the way. And without a lamp that could burn, without the oil as... Um, the source of the burning, and oil is basically having the Holy Spirit. If you, if you look at Scripture, oil a lot of times goes back to the Holy Spirit. Um, they didn't have it. They didn't have the oil. 
Um, so basically, a, a, the girl without the oil served no purpose and was not part of the kingdom. Do you have the light of salvation? And that's something that we need to discuss because you need to be spiritually prepared for the bridegroom. Bridegroom being Jesus. Uh, the bride is the church. Are you spiritually prepared for his return? And do you have the light of salvation? All right, so we looked at the uh, being ready for service and keeping your lamps burning. Um, now we're going to go to verse 36. It says, Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. Weddings back then could last a lot longer than they do now. Um, maybe some of you uh, are going to some weddings this summer, uh, or maybe you remember back when you were married and planning for it. I know when Cassie and I got married, we planned for, uh, I think I could be wrong, Cassie, I don't think would be upset that I don't know exactly the time, but it was early afternoon, and we planned for our wedding to go through till like 9 or 10 at night. The weddings then, they went days. They went, um, they could go up to a week long. So when the master left to go to a wedding, they had to put somebody in charge and because their timing was unknown when they would actually return. So someone had to be in charge of the household and they were to be doing the work. You need to put yourself in this position when you're thinking about your own life and what's going on uh, is that you are to be doing the work of the master, the master being our father in heaven. And work is a good thing. I don't know if you guys remember when I preached uh, over a year ago. I don't even remember when this was. Uh, we looked at Genesis and work in general. For a lot of my life, I thought work was a punishment. But now that I studied Genesis, the Adam and Eve were working in the garden before sin entered the picture. It was a good thing for them to be working. Uh, and I, I think my, my opinion would be that even when we get to heaven, there's a chance that we may, we may have the opportunity to do work. Because work is good. It's not a punishment. Um, and then I already went over, like, each one of you are uniquely crafted and created to do a certain thing. Um, last week when Joe spoke about um, how we, how we uh, approach church, how we approach our spiritual life, how it's supposed to have reverence and awe, um, I remember, I don't know when this clicked finally in my head, but for a long time I thought be, coming to church is when I could be in the presence of God. But that's not true because when we become a Christian, Jesus did that for us. We can now enter the presence of God anytime we want to. We actually have the Holy Spirit within us. That should change the way we live. God should be a part of everything that we do. Even the nerdy things that I do, uh, God has been able to work through those. I'll give you an example. Um, besides a few people, a few guys in this church that can uh, talk to me about big-time wrestling, there's one other thing that's a little bit nerdy that I do that God has used in the past, and that's remote control cars. So growing up, I always enjoyed playing with remote control cars, the, the cheap ones that we would get from the store. Uh, or I think there was one time we went to Cedar Point, and they had remote control boats there as well. It was always fun to me to play with remote control cars. So when I became an adult and could spend the money on a nice one, we did that. Uh, actually, my dad and I... Uh, both have trucks that we, we, we like to race. We don't get to do it too often. But I'll give you an example of what happened. There was a guy who used to live, uh, he was a neighbor of the church here, and he showed up out of nowhere, uh, pulled into the parking lot. Um, I think he actually messaged me on Facebook ahead of time, just let me know. Um, but he showed up and had some questions about the church. He had been a neighbor for quite a while, uh, and then had a couple questions about um, the possibility of using our property to race remote control cars. So obviously when I heard that, I, I lit up immediately, like, oh, like, tell me more about that. Like, what do you do? Um, he probably had no idea that I was just as knowledgeable as he probably was about what, what he was doing. So it struck up a conversation, and we, got, we come to find out we knew a few of the same people, and we, we gave them permission to, you know, race their our cars out in the parking lot, and that conversation then led to him showing up throughout the week when I was here and we would pray together. Uh, he had some health issues and he, I think at times, was scared. Um, scared of, there were some pretty severe things that could happen with his health. 
But he came over here. The little conversation we had about RC cars uh, led to a friendship, which then led to the man um, seeking out prayer uh, from, from not, not that I'm anything special, but someone he knew, uh, that he knew that would pray for him. And then also, it was so cool because we would then have conversations about his past with experience with church. And uh, I don't know if you remember, even back in the summer, he then began to attend our outdoor services. Um, but it all started with a conversation with, about remote control cars. Long story short, short <laughs> um, is that I think God can use every unique detail about you. Obviously, I don't know every single thing about each one of you. But there's something I think that you can think of right now that if you dedicated it to God, you said, God, use this, uh, whatever this thing is, and I promise you he will come through with whatever that is. It's been my experience several ways um, that that's been the case. All right, let's let's quickly look at um, the faithful and unfaithful servant, uh, because that is our final two points here. And you need to remember that Jesus is in a large crowd. It's very important because... He's going to give an illustration or a parable about everyone. And then Peter actually says this in verse 41. He, he kind of interrupts Jesus' speaking because he's getting confused. And he says, Peter says, Jesus, um, I, I'm, are you speaking to us, like the disciples? Or are you speaking to everyone? Because there's thousands of people here. And he's getting really specific about what's going on. Peter's confused. I love Peter because he's always, he's always honest and real. So he's, he's asking a question because he's like, I don't know what's going on. Who are you talking to? And, and Jesus responds with this, and it's verse 42 to 46. Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions, but if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know. And it gets a little graphic. It says, I'll cut him into pieces and put him with the unfaithful. This encompasses everyone. So Peter's question of, who are you talking to? Jesus, answered, Jesus doesn't give an answer of, I'm talking to this person, this person, this person. He just says, there's going to be a faithful and unfaithful servant. And that encompasses everyone. So everyone here this morning will fall within those two categories. We are either faithful or we are not. So what is the faithful servant? So the next slide here gives us some details on what is a faithful servant. Uh, first and foremost is it's someone who has responded correctly to salvation. This is not a, I've been to church. This is not, I read my Bible every once in a while. I, I hang out with some Christians. It is, what is, has been your response to Jesus? Have you responded correctly? Luke 9, if you would want to uh, read through that, 23 to 26, uh, gives a little bit more detail about responding correctly to salvation. I want to say this also, because uh, I think there's a chance that if, if we're not careful, we can get confused on who Jesus of the Bible is. And I want to say Jesus of the, the Bible because there are other prophets, there are other religions that would say, oh yeah, Jesus, yeah, we, we know him, we know of him, we, like he's in history, he's a historical figure. And they may even say that he's a God or became a God. There are different interpretations of who Jesus actually was. And it's really important that you know the only way of salvation is through Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of um, the, the prophets in, in the Mormon religion. It's not the Jesus of Islam. It is the Jesus of the Bible. In Matthew 25, uh, that, that verse of the ten virgins, basically half of them were saying, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but the, the truth of the matter is that only half of them actually knew who Jesus truly was and had a relationship with him. That is a sobering thought to think that if we don't respond to salvation correctly, we will not be counted as that faithful servant. Um, also, surrender to the Holy Spirit. Um, the word sanctification, if you don't know what that is, uh, it, I, I've actually got, a, I think, a 10-page paper on it. There's a lot of detail you can go into on sanctification, but I'll leave it at this. 
Um, and you can look at 2 Peter 3.14 uh, for even a little bit more detail on it. But basically, sanctification is the continual surrender to the Holy Spirit to work in your life to make you more like Jesus. Uh, for me, there came a time in my life when I was about 16 years old that I was really trying to live by the law, the law of Jesus, the law of the Bible, uh, doing things that I was supposed to do, and I found myself failing more often than not. And part of the problem was that I was trying to do it on my own strength. I was trying to uh, be obedient. I was trying to uh, be the, the witness I was supposed to be at school. And I kept failing, and I finally told God, God, I, I can't do this without your help. I, I tried my best. I tried to do what you called me to do. I even tried to lead some Bible studies, and I'm struggling and I've gotten better at that. I'm still not perfect uh, by no means and never will be. But sanctification was that basically the understanding that we truly can't do what we need to do to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit's empowerment through that. And then sanctification is the, the work um, that he does within us. So I was very relieved when I learned about sanctification that, yeah, it's kind of a process um, that we go through that we become more like Jesus. What is the unfaithful servant? And this is like the girls without a light. And the harsh reality is that it's required. Uh, to, you are required to be a faithful servant to enter into heaven. Um, this is someone who has responded incorrectly to salvation. In our men's Bible study, we're studying Samson. And everyone knows the Samson story. He's a very strong man uh, involved in lots of problematic relationships and was seeking out things he shouldn't have. But Samson took a vow, a Nazarite vow, and there was three things he couldn't do. Three things he couldn't do is touch something unclean. Um, also, he couldn't drink alcohol and he could not cut his hair. Now, the cutting the hair was the outward symbol that he had taken the vow. And what's interesting about Samson is that the hair was the outward symbol that other people knew he took this vow. And it's also where his strength came from. But if he was alone and touched something unclean, like a dead animal, which he did do, uh, nobody else would know. And if he ended up drinking alcohol um, and went against his vow and did this in, well, it could have been in private or public, but maybe nobody else knew, he kept the outward appearance of his vow, of the Nazarite vow, and I think that's where a lot of us fall into today as well. And I've, I've been guilty of this, where I wanted the benefit of other people looking at me as like someone who is a righteous person or, or someone who is a good Christian. But inside, I, I, I was dealing with problems that nobody else knew about. And I was giving in to things that nobody else knew about. But I had the outward appearance of being a Christian, the outward appearance of someone who is dedicated to a life of obedience to Christ. And that's what those ten virgins were doing in Matthew 25, is, is they had the lamp, they were, they were probably dressed and ready, but they didn't have the oil. They didn't have the Holy Spirit within them. They were not born again. So the unfaithful servant is someone who did not respond correctly. And then uh, in 40, verses 45 and 46 is the harsh reality it says, the master of that servant will come on a day he does not know and, or expect him and will cut him into pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Basically, uh, that's going to assign him in a place with the unbelievers. So the unfaithful servant is an unbeliever. Uh, a final quote to leave you with is from John MacArthur. I like reading John MacArthur's uh, commentaries. Uh, I don't agree with him on everything, um, but he has a lot of good things to say. And this quote I took out of the commentary says, The redeemed demonstrate their readiness for Christ's return by pursuing a godly life. So here, here's what I want you to leave with. Is that are you pursuing a godly life? What, what evidence is there? What's, even if somebody doesn't know you go to church, maybe they just see you living your life. And maybe you never even had a conversation about church. But if you told them you were a Christian and you went to church, would they be surprised or not surprised? So what evidence do others see in you? And I want to say this also, it's okay to have a beginning. Maybe you're a new Christian, 
um, and you just re- you're just working on your relationship with God, getting to know Him better through His Word, that's okay. But we have to be pursuing a godly life throughout our life, and we can't stay at that baby stage of, of just um, being saved from hell. We need to be pursuing a godly life. So the application for this morning is we all have a purpose, but what is, what is yours? Uh, the, a person without a purpose can quickly be frustrated, become depressed, and not know what life's purpose is. If you, if you don't know what God has made you to do and, and aren't pursuing it, and, and I can tell you that if you want to know the answers to that, you can just look to God's Word. He will tell you what you're supposed to be doing. It's really not that difficult. Um, I think we make it too difficult when we think it's some big grand idea of what the final destination is, when really it's a day-to-day living. So what is your purpose? Because without that purpose, you'll quickly become frustrated um, and possibly even depressed and, and have all your, uh, these mental problems trying to figure out what you're doing. Work is good. Work is good. It's something we're designed to do. So pray for God to open your eyes to the work He has for you. So what is your purpose? Every single one of you have one. What are you supposed to be doing? And then seek out the opportunities to serve. The, those may pop up in the most random ways, and that's okay. Uh, mine started with a conversation about remote control cars, which then led to uh, talking about scripture and prayer together and praying for healing. They will show up if you seek out the opportunities, I promise you. Uh, so as we, as we close up, uh, I'm going to pray. Uh, and then we have a final song. Uh, just, just take a moment and pray for God to open your eyes for what he has for you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this passage in Luke that you've, you've even uh, you've directed my heart towards first and the, the fact that it stuck out to me being ready for service that we're made to do something and keeping our lamps burning. I know you set us apart. I know that you've given us the Holy Spirit that's enabled us to do the work we're supposed to do. And I pray that you would convict us, open our eyes, and show us what we're supposed to be doing and help us seek out those opportunities. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.